what I'd like to do right now is welcome Bree Babineau to the stage. How are you? I'm doing good. Amazing. Let's have a seat. All Let's right. Have a seat. Hey, so, y'all. She came in just so cool this evening. She came in just so cool. She was just so down earth. You know how sometimes you get people that like these, these, go these gospel artists, you know they can be kind of special at times. Oh, I need this. I need green M&Ms on the left side of the stage okay. in a blue <laughs> container. You need to go home. But that wasn't Bree. Bree just came in and she was so happy. We set her up in her little room and everything, and she was just so happy about it. But no, they took care. This. No, they took care of okay. me, y'all. I walked in the room, and they had pictures of my son in there, and it melted my heart, like really, y'all. So tell me, how did that make you feel? Out. How did that make you feel? No, that made me feel real good. Like I've been away from from my son for over a week, and I saw him last night, and he was like crying and didn't want me to go. So. Just to see that and see those pictures, it melted my heart. Like, it really, really did. It made, made it e this little trip easy for me. It really did. Okay, so normally when you travel and you go to various places and you minister before thousands upon thousands of people, how are you normally treated just as an artist and as a person? How am I? I'm normally treated good. Okay. Pe they, they take care of me. They really, really do. So no complaints? <laughs> I told you they're real people. I tell you they're just real people. I'm not going to say all of you know, I ain't never had no issues. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, but for the most part, they, they take care of me. Okay, yeah. okay. And, and tell me, with you being a new mother, how difficult is it for you to travel, for you to go and do what you do, knowing that you got a baby boy at mm, home? You know, it's different. Um... It's different being, oh, look at my, look at my baby. <laughs> so cute, okay. Um, no, but uh, it's, it's touch and go. Okay. You know, um, my baby is literally me, just in boy form, literally. Full of energy, light up any room. Um, and I think what makes it easy is I have a great support system. Um, and uh, when they say it takes a village, it really takes a village. And I'm grateful to have uh, my support system, my family, his father, um, his grandparents, you know, they always step in whenever I need them. So I'm never um, worried about him, his safety, or anything like that because I know that he's um, in great hands at all times. But I do be missing him and FaceTiming him throughout the day, several times. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's touch and go. So, but how are you able to balance that, being a new mother and being away from your son and being away from your family? Because you're on the road quite a bit. Right. Um, I think when I, first, when I first started, I was gone a lot okay. um, in the beginning. And um, the good thing now is, you know, you can take things and you can decline things if okay. need be. Okay. Um, and so uh, when I feel like, you know, okay, I may sit this one out, you know, I've been gone a long time. But um, it, it's, 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 diff it's different now because I have a, um, a baby and he's so young. Okay. Um, but the great thing about what I do is I can bring him right along with me on this road. Mm -hmm. You know, and I have done that. Um, and usually when that happens, um, my mom, she comes with me and okay. she attends to him and, and stuff like that. So uh, I love my little job. It's flexible, you know. You, you know, you know. You sometimes so you, you can't bring your baby to work, but I'm able to do. But I'm yes. Okay. And I'm able to bring him, you know, if need be. And like I said, whenever he does come, um, my mom, she comes with me and she tends to him for okay. me. Yeah. Right. So, so, so let me ask this question. So. Well, not so much a question, but a statement. Mm -hmm. You didn't start the traditional way mm -hmm. in this whole gospel arena. You started with a YouTube channel back in 2015, 2016, and you just went and blew up real quick. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that experience, because you didn't just start and somebody discovered you. you 
you right. kind of put your own self out there. Well, some some friends of mine kind of put me on out there. <laughs> so what happened was, so um, in December of 2014, um, I went to uh, a worship night that uh, one of my friends was having, um, and I wasn't even going to go to it. But uh, they kept calling me, kept calling me, so I went. And we were just in there clowning and just singing different songs. And um, another friend who I grew up with was pretty much recording the whole night on his phone. And he actually posted the video on his Facebook page. And I woke up the next morning with a ton of like friend requests and Facebook messages from people all over the world. I don't even know who those people were. And they were just like, man, this video um, just touched me and blessed me. And I was like, what video? <laughs> Like, what, what video are y'all talking about? So I had to go and actually look for the video because I didn't know what they were talking about. And, of course, people were tagging me in it. And um, I was I was tripped out. I'm not even going to sit here and, and lie. I was like, I don't, you know, what is happening, what's going on. But I didn't think, you know, um, too much of it. I was just um, thankful and grateful that people were being blessed by the video. And literally um, every video that was posted after that, people begin to gravitate to it and, you know, um, different artists and different um, producers and different people begin to um, reach out and want to work with me. And um, if you know me, uh, that wasn't something that I wanted to do. Singing was not something that I wanted to do. I did it in church because it was a need and I was a pastor's kid and you know, you're kind of forced to work in ministry. You have no choice Don't but to fulfill. To the no, but you, about that. you have no choice but to fulfill the need um, in, 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 in church and stuff. And so um, I could sing, so I led praise and worship, was on the praise team and, and all of that. But singing and doing this as a career, as a profession was, not something you know that I wanted to do at the time I was in school to become a lawyer and that's really you know what I wanted to, to do at that time but um, I you know decided to go ahead and do it the father threw me in it um, but <laughs> over the years um, I've grown to love it and appreciate it um, but it was a journey uh, it was it was different. It was uh, very very uncomfortable because I didn't like to be in the spotlight, and you know all of that was new. Mm -hmm. You know you got people looking at you, looking up to you, and you're like, whoa, what's happening? You know, so everything changed for me very very quickly, and it was a uh, it was a big adjustment. It really was. So with that being said, and, and, and you just went through this like warp speed, almost elevation and being exposed like that. Yeah, he did a quick work. It was quick. I wasn't job. ready. Yeah. But, so what did a day in the life of Bree Bavino look like prior to then post? Oh, okay. So <laughs> I went to school Monday through Friday. Okay. Um, and I had a regular uh, job working at uh, Dillard's. Um, it's a clothing store in the mall. And I that's what I did. And so then I did, was, was, was and I did church. Elevation. Yeah, and I did, you know, we had like, you know, rehearsal for, mm -hmm. you know, praise team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you you went to church on Sundays and on Saturdays you you did street meetings and all going door to door and all of those things like that. So uh, that was the norm. That was. So then all this blew up just real quick. Overnight right. you became what I would just call a sensation overnight. So once that happened, then how did things change with respect to just your normal routine? Oh, everything changed. Um, everything changed. Everybody knew me as the girl with the eyebrows and the girl who was sitting on a sofa in the living room. You the girl who's sitting on a sofa singing in the living room. Mm -hmm. Everything was different. Um, but it wasn't a bad different. It was just it was just different. It was something um, that I wasn't expecting. And um, 
I had to try to adjust um, I was still adjusting. I wasn't fully adjusted. <laughs> but it took some time. It really did uh, because I was thrown in it, like, really. Like, there was no, oh, Lord, they, they got the label here. It, it was no such thing as, like, oh, okay, I'm going to just go ahead. It was no such thing as artist development. Like, artist development or, like, management, like, telling me what to do and how to do it, do this and do that. So I was really like thrown into something and had to try to figure figure it out. So you had to navigate the waters of this whole thing. Yeah. Without any. What you say? What you say, Brian? Okay. I thought you said something. No, but it, it it was a big adjustment, you know, and 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 you you didn't have um you didn't have like you know how some people or some people, you know, they've been doing this, or being groomed right. as a kid, you know, and been doing this all of, all of their lives, wanting to be a singer and all of this stuff like that. That wasn't me, you know? Like, I wasn't like a, a Ja'Kalen Carr who had been preaching since she was eight years old and singing and all that stuff like that, or a Corinne Hawthorne who was doing the, the different singing competitions and had aspirations to be a, that wasn't me. So I had to learn and, and, and figure out how to navigate this whole industry thing, this whole artist thing, you know, and, 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 and it, it, took, it took some time. So, so where were the mentors? Who, who mentored you? And it was probably more your parents <laughs> uh, kind of did some things, but where were your mentors at? Where they at? I'm still looking for them. You, you're still looking for them? I'm waiting for them. Where y'all at? No, I didn't have, that's what I'm saying. So I didn't have, like, people, and y'all don't take this bad, but, you know, I didn't have anybody taking me under their wing. So Nobody he, took me under their wing and was like, come on, I'm going to show you the rope. This will be going. I didn't have that. So how does that make you feel knowing that you did this kind of on your own to a certain extent? Because I think, and I, and I tell some people that I work with that, Sometimes the tow truck needs a tow truck. Mm -hmm. But who tows the tow truck when the tow truck breaks down? So my question to you is, when you had those moments, because I know there had to be moments, yeah, where maybe. you just wanted to say, not heaven no, but. No, I, so no, I had moments, okay. like many, many moments, and it's crazy because, you know, a lot of times people would say, you know, you're not serious about this. You don't want to do this. And it's not that I'm not serious about it. I wasn't serious about it and didn't want to do it. It's, it's that I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, can you help me? You know what I'm saying? Like, can you teach me the formula? Like, mm -hmm. I'm the type of person like, hey, you may have to take my hand and, you know, help me and, and, and help and show me and teach me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm in a season, you know, even now where, you know, teach me. I want to be taught, you know what I'm saying? So I can continue on in this journey. But there were times when, like, I would cry. Wow. And be like, Lord, I don't know if I could do this. I really don't know if this is for me, if I'm supposed to be doing this. But if it's still in your will and this is something that you want me to do, then show me. Show me a sign. Give me something that I'm still, you know, Called by you and you and you're and you're gonna do this and literally every single time I kid you not every single time I would pray that some random celebrity would repost a video or um, that literally every single time mm -hmm. whether it was Justin Bieber reposting it or uh, Chance the Rapper commenting on something or Tyrese posting something but literally I'm like you got to give me a sign because all I'm seeing is the same thing. I don't know if I'm, maybe, you know, I've reached my max. Maybe I've reached, you know, my limit in this thing, you know, and maybe I'm so supposed to be doing something quit? else. Why didn't you quit in the midst of all that? Because has anybody ever just quit or wanted to quit? I know I have. And I'm just getting ready to be honest. I'm just being transparent. 
I'm not a quitter, but mm -hmm. there's been times where I just like, okay, I just can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. What made Brie Babineau stay with it though? Knowing that you didn't have that. Knowing that you didn't have anybody to, that was gonna strengthen your back for the journey, but God. Right. I think that's what it is. Okay. You know, um, and I had a lot of, see the crazy thing is, um, and I'm, and I'm grateful to the people who've um, followed my journey and, and, and been with me from the start of it, um, because the people who follow me are, they're unorthodox. You know, they, they may not be what your normal, you know, go, your normal church goers or, you know, m m the people that support me, um, they don't look like make church people. They don't, <laughs> you, they really don't, but, um, but they listen to me. They wow. may not listen to any other and any other gospel artists, but they listen to me. You know so what I'm saying? You have and, their ear. Yeah, and so like you know, I, I I kept pushing, you know, because I'm still, even though I couldn't see it, I was still making impact. You know what okay. I'm saying? Okay. And you know, I give God all the praise um, because. When, I, when you feel like, you know, this is it, it's over, you know, God isn't, you know, using you anymore, you know, he'll show you different things and he'll, you know, uh, pour into you. And that's literally who's been pouring into me throughout this entire journey is him. So because if, if it wasn't for him, I, I promise you I wouldn't be doing this. I really wouldn't be. So if you're looking in that camera right there and there's a young artist that's saying, okay, I'm done. I want to give up. I just want to throw in a towel. Or you got somebody in these seats that's doing something. It may not be gospel singing. It may just be their business that they started and they're just struggling with it. What would you tell them? Who? Okay. Well, um, the first thing I would ask is, um, is God calling you to do it? Because if he's calling you to it, then he's going to see you through it. So that's the first thing. Um, and, you know, to never, never give up, never quit. Uh, I'm an athlete. So quitting is not an option. Um, and for me, I'm always big on... Um, hey, if this is what I, if God is calling me to this, like, I'm going to do this until you tell me to do something else. So if he's not telling you to do something else, then that means you got to just stay right in there. Stay with it. You know, um, pray, um, get a great support team, uh, people who can encourage you and strengthen you when you feel weak and you can't strengthen yourself. Um, make sure you have a good team and, 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 and I mean, trust, trust the process. You got to trust the process. I'm telling you, just, you have to trust the process and believe in what God told you that he was going to do. So if he, I'm telling you, if he brought you to it, he going to see you through it. So you just got to remember that. Keep, keep speaking over yourself. Okay. Just keep speaking over yourself. So you saying trust the process, mm -hmm. but when the process and you've put all your trust in it, but it's not yielding the results that you pray for in your time. Well, this is the thing. <laughs> we gotta remember the story of Job, okay? Mm -hmm. Now you see, Job, Job went through many, many oppositions and he was faced with many hardships. Like literally, his own wife was saying, curse your God and die, you know what I'm saying? But he knew in the God that he served. You know what I'm saying? So you have to remember who's on your side. You know, you may not be able to see, you know what I'm saying, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Everything may look like, okay, this is, this is it. Like, I, this is, is, is it. I'm seeing everything falling. I'm seeing, you know, things not happening. But you got to trust the process and you got to wait on. I, I have a song saying, I will wait. Okay? You got to wait on him. No matter how long it takes, 
You got to wait on him and you got to be patient. I'm preaching to myself. You have to, you know? Wow. You, you, you do, you know? Because we can get so caught up into, you know, wanting things done quick. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want it right now, I want it right now, but maybe we're not ready to have it right now. Because if we get it right now, we may fumble it right now. You know what I'm saying? So let's just be patient and wait on God. And I'm telling you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be beautiful in the end, but you just got to be patient. So that takes me to a scripture that says, they that wait on the Lord. And he says, shall renew your strength. So here's my question to you is, you've been singing forever, mm -hmm. even as a little girl. Now you're a big girl, <laughs> a grown girl, a grown woman with a child. You ready to sing for these wonderful people? Yeah. How many of y'all ready to hear Brie Babineau sing? <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going right. to exit off the stage. You're going to exit off the stage? And I'm going to let you do what you All do. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Brie Babineau. <laughs> Somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. If, I lost if I lost everything and didn't have
Somebody say the Father paid it all for us. Somebody say I don't have to worry about a thing. Because he didn't pay it all. Come on, move with me just one more time. Hey, come on, come on, come on. Oh, my, 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 my.
what is done from me. Yes. 
say something like this. Late in the midnight hour, God's gonna turn it around. He's gonna work in your favor. Did you believe it? Hey, late in, late in the midnight, God's gonna, God's gonna, it's gonna work. Do you believe it? Hey, yeah, late in the midnight, come on. God's gonna. So you've been at this thing for two plus decades. And I know it hasn't always been easy. I know you've had your challenging times. I know you've had your moments. And what we were just telling the crowd, and I was just explaining to them, is that we oftentimes recognize the art, but don't know the artist. So tell me about Bashan Mitchell, the artist. Not so much what you do on the stage, but just you as the man. Wow. Um over a few decades. I'm from South Side Chicago, like I said, just a regular guy. My grandparents raised me, you know, we were coming through the 70s and 80s when I was born, so my mother was about 15 when she had me, so my grandparents raised me and sent her down south to get right. Okay. And uh, so you know, you know how that go. But I grew up in, in a, it's a pretty rough time, you know, to be totally honest, you know, that's when carjackings were going on and I was trying to go to high school and uh, drugs started getting real bad in the south suburbs. Uh, but I have to say that through it all, God had a plan for me that I didn't even see at that time. Because all my friends, you know, they were getting caught up in stuff, and I was the one that, around them, but I wouldn't get caught. So it was, it was, it was, it was, 
truly in God's plan for me to be where I am today because he covered me so many years. So you just paid, but you just didn't get caught. Yeah. Well, I got caught later on. We'll talk about that later. Okay. But, <laughs> I didn't get caught then. I got you. Uh, but, but, but yeah, it, it, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, we are little Jesus walking around the world, but we have, we went through the same thing everybody been through, you know. Uh, you know, definitely a rough childhood, but, but being kept is part of my story. So what are some of the real things that you dealt with growing up in Chicago that was just very challenging that you had to, and then like we talked earlier, navigate the waters to get around, even though you was trying to get through? But what were just some of those challenges for you? Well, you know what, it's, it's, it's I, I wouldn't even say I navigated. Okay. I believe that sometimes I got, got covered or pulled out. Okay. Um, um, you know, from, from dealing with gangs and dealing with violence well, from, and still making it. And then, you know, I tell the story a lot about how I got caught driving on suspended license and one of my friends had drugs in the car and I ended up doing like about, they, they gave me 14 days in the county jail, uh, but I only did seven because I ain't know. But um, I was in there and uh, that's when I started to think about, you know, all the stuff that, that I was still ministering music at church, I was directing choirs and, and moving around, you know, but still in jail. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you, you, you still in church? Yeah. Well, you in jail? Yeah. You shot? No. <laughs> but we get super saints who act like they are. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, because you sing and you praise and worship, and you don't have real challenges that you So, so with. that's the truth of it is that, you know, I, I wrote a little, I'm writing a book called Everything I Did, I Did in Church, which is really funny. Yeah, you know, so I plan on putting it out next year, but it's about the struggles that we have, and we're still in church. Um, but I was in jail, and the crazy thing about me being in jail, because if you had an outdate, uh, you got to be <laughs> in, a, in like a dormitory room, and the person next to you is in there. So I was literally next to the person who was leading Bible study. Wow. So he passed out these little red Bibles with the little blank pages in the front. Anybody know about that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Somebody been there before. And um, <laughs> that's when I took the little half pencil and I wrote, you don't know my story, all the things I've been through. You can't feel my pain, wow. but I had to go through to get here. Because a lot of people, yeah, yeah, yeah a lot of people understand it. Yeah. 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 Because I was sitting there and I realized everything that everyone told me, others may, but you may not, and God has a plan for you. And, you know, everything went through my head because I was trying to get out. But um, I, I wrote the song, um, my, You Can't Feel My Pain, what I had to go through to get here because my worship is for real. And that's when I began to, to understand what it meant to have a real worship and a real relationship with God regardless of what it looks like around you. So... I read somewhere that you had a mentor, and he basically kind of took you up underneath his wings and got you to, and I'll just say to where you are today, what was that experience like? Did, did, were there some days that you wanted to fight your mentor? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what, no. No, God sent me the right person, mm -hmm. right? So my mentor is Baby Wines, and uh, yeah, the one of God's best, um, and who don't really deal with all the foo-foo stuff. So when he say something, he's so stern with it, and he's like, you need to do this, and this, and this. And I'm the kind of person, you have to tell me like that, or I'm gonna mess up and try it another way. Okay. So basically, I like stern direction. I, I deal better with someone who's direct with me, not give me all the all the roundabouts of, of who, with, when, and there, and all that. And that's the kind of relationship we have. And one thing about our relationship is that he never tells me what to do. He shows me by example. And that makes a big difference, and, and you know, especially when you watch somebody put it. Um, and he's there when I do the wrong thing, not to say I told you so, but to be there to help build me back up. So, so, so he'll check you too, but he'll build you back Absolutely. up. Absolutely. So tell me, how did you deal with the success? In 2011, you, you penned a song, Nobody Greater. And I don't know if you penned that before, or whatever, but it was released in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And it was the number one most played gospel song for that whole year. So there was many gospel songs that were written and played. And I don't even know if you even know it, but it was the number one and the most played gospel song in 2011. How did you deal with that level of success with a song like that? Uh, you, for, first of all, I have to uh, fix it. I didn't write this one. Okay. I actually recorded that one. 
Um, I wrote a lot of songs. That was written by uh, a young man in Atlanta, Georgia, Darius. Okay. Uh, Polk who wrote that song. Um, but it was easier for me to deal with success that I didn't know I had. Elaborate. So when God takes you from the back to the front and you learn how to serve and you serve well, then you bring your servant to, to the front. So basically everything that everyone else saw, I didn't see it the same way. So I, I was going into doors I didn't think were open for me. I was going on the platforms that were that were made and, and I didn't really see it as everyone else saw it. To maybe two or three years later I could look back on it and say, Wow, I did that. You know, because I am um, and I don't mind telling my story, especially to other artists, is that just two years before nobody greater, I was a seat filler at the Stella Awards. And if you know what a seat filler is, that means you put on all black and you sit in somebody's seat till they come back. Well, two years later, my face was on the seat. So that's what God does. You know, he don't waste time. He does it. And I believe not because I was a great singer, not because I'm the greatest writer, but because I serve well. Uh, because God, God don't mind elevating a servant because they know what to do when they get there. And, and that, that's, that's my story. I don't know about everybody else's story, but he elevated a servant to the place to be. But how did they deal with, what, how did you deal with your ego knowing that you were a seat filler? Did, did that make you feel some type of way? No, no. That was actually, I, 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 it's almost like I waited for this time. You know, so, so you know how, um, just say because you, you're in college and you're going to lunch, right? Okay. It's time to eat, so everyone knows time. Okay. But it's not your turn until you get your tray and you put everything on it and you go eat, wow. right? Wow. So basically, it was always time, even when I was in a seat filler. But God didn't make it my turn until I was left. You know what I'm that's, that's just how it works. So when you use your time to prepare for your turn, then your ego doesn't change. So what did you do while you were waiting on your turn during your time? I still worked. I worked. I wrote for other artists. I was writing for Vanessa Bell Armstrong, Smokey Norfolk, Bishop Morton, Bishop Trotter, and produced Tasha Cobbs, and produced uh, executive producer with Anthony Brown. Um, I've always worked, and that's one thing that even after success, I kept doing. You know, I kept serving, and I kept serving at Full Gospel as well. Uh, we, we, we sometimes let go of the things that made us because we were made. But to me, that is that is gratifying to me to always go back and do what made me. So you have a new project out now, yeah. which I, I took exception to. I, I really did, because you had me looking real bad. Oh yeah, you had me looking real bad. I'm like, when I see you, I'm gonna fight him. <laughs> I asked my, my my sound team to uh, download a song. And this one particular song, and I just want you guys to hear the word, the, the, the first verse of it, it, I was mad at you. Oh. And I'm gonna tell you why. I, after y'all hear this first, Tony, do me a favor, cue up that song, please. I, I, I want you guys just to hear the first verse of it. Um, Rashawn Mitchell had me feeling some type of way. Do, do you have it, Tony? Okay. Why he's getting it, so what ended up happening was, and once you hear the, the verse of it, you'll get it. It's like you checked me through the spirit. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know him like that. How can he be saying nothing to me like this? So I'm driving, and I'm listening to your new project, which is absolutely amazing, y'all. You gotta go download it. Download it, don't go get nobody to burn you a CD, because we don't do that no more. <laughs> Download it, go to your little app store and get Deshaun Mitchell's new project. I'm driving and I'm listening to this song, the Valley song. And I'm sitting up here, and again, when you guys hear the word, once they get that queued up, it's going you understand. And I'm sitting there and I heard the first verse and I I got mad. And I'm like, did he just pull up on me and check me in the spirit? And it, it was just like you, like you knew me and knew what I was going through because I, I just recently come out of a, a valley or a desert experience. And in this particular verse and everything, it talked about lifting your hands in the valley. It talked about dancing in the desert. And I don't want to do none of that. I want to have a pity party right there. 
I wanted to be mad in the desert. I wanted to be mad in the valley. I didn't want to come out of the valley. I just wanted to have an attitude. But everything he said in the song spoke to the mature way of handling adversity. Turn it up, turn it up, please. Start it from the beginning. So they begin. Listen to this. Push play, please. <laughs> and y'all listen. Just listen to the lyrics. six months when they need goodness. It's going to make sense to them. That's the type of music I ask God to give me in these times. 
I mean, he definitely did it with that ballet song, but then he followed it up with See the Goodness. I was just so mad with you. <laughs> I, I was because when you convicted me, you was like, okay, just chill out, bro, because you get ready to see the goodness. So the song just really just coincide with what I was dealing with. Praise right here, then I'm going to show you something. Because it took me to the scripture after you had suffered a while. Then it said, then. Then. But sometimes you got to go through that suffering stage. You got to go through that period. And you know, like Brie was saying, you got to be patient and you just got to go through the process. Yeah, and, and we've been so, so, uh, those of us who are church, like me, I grew up in church. We, we, we've been taught so long of waiting to the good by and by. You know, I, I, and I knew God didn't want me to wait till I get to heaven to get all the good stuff. I just knew that. So, so th this, this whole sound is all things work together. You can praise him in the valley. You will see the goodness. Be desperate for God. Um, you know, God is up to something. Every song on this new project is really about building and strengthening you to see God bring you a little bit of heaven on earth. Listen, I, I just want to say the project is absolutely amazing. I hope you win multiple, multiple, multiple awards for it because you bless me. You bless me. Like I said, you check me, but you bless me. Yes, and I'll take it. I'll take it. But do y'all want to hear him sing a few songs? Yeah. Now, when you start singing, I want you to act like you keep that same energy. Don't just be sitting there looking. I promise you I won't let you back. Now, he brought a few singers with him, and they're going to come up here, and they're going to bless the stage, and they're going to do some amazing things. So, ladies and gentlemen, the sound is How y'all doing in Indianapolis? It's always good to come close to home. My first engagement as an artist was in Indianapolis. I thank God for it. Uh, this is back in the day when Rodney Bryan was doing the Black Expo and, and, and all that. And he, he brought my little choir here. And we, we did our A and B selection and all that. <laughs> We're back home. Uh, but it has been a great place, a great city for me. And I'm always grateful for my, my start. Because I started just driving up the street two hours and a half, and then God would take that boy all the way to Africa, and all the way to Australia, all the way to the like, Dominican Republic, and wherever else he's taking me to. Right from here. So, we're gonna do this first song, it's a new song, and it's my first time doing the track to it, so I gotta act like y'all like it, and then we'll do something more that y'all like in a second. But the Bible says that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, and are called according to his purpose, hasn't it? Whenever y'all ready, y'all can press it. Let's go. Let's make some noise up in here. Yeah. And we are called 
for the good of them that love the Lord. And the good news is that it's working right now. Here we go. Oh 